alive at all tonight. I don't even know what's going on. How's it going, Real Life Revival? Good? Awesome. Um, as Rusty said, uh, my husband Mike and I got to be a part of the team that planted a Mission Church in Ventura 11 years ago. We just turned 11 a couple of weeks ago. And man, being a part of planting Mission and what God is doing in the lives of people in Ventura has been like the greatest faith adventure of our lives. Um, but I just have to say, since I get to be here with you, we cannot imagine Mission without Real life. Real life is such a part of our story. Um, it was through a relationship with Rusty that we even ended up in California. When he heard we were praying about planting a church, he said, how about California? We will support you. And this church has supported us financially, supported us through wisdom, given us friendship. Um, so many of you showed up at our grand opening 11 years ago. I sent people for six months to volunteer and serve at Mission while we built a core team. I mean, we cannot imagine Mission without Real Life Church. So since I get to be here with you, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being, um, man, being a kingdom-minded church. Being a church that cares about church planting. Being a, a people that, that loves and invests in people you may never meet this side of eternity. In the last 11 years, Mission has baptized 1,300 people and you are a part of their stories. You're a part of those stories. So thank you so much. And man, Mission is in on the Ohio Valley Project. We're so excited. Love Kyle. People at Mission are getting excited to see what God might do in that community of people. I mean, I'm just stoked because this feels like I'm here with family. And tonight, as we just want to ignite around this idea, this prayer that we want to pray, that we want to be true of us, is God, give us your heart for people. And this has been a journey for me personally, um, because when I was 12 years old, um, we moved from rural Kentucky, a church, uh, a town of like 7,000, um, including the cows, um, to plant a church in Las Vegas, Nevada. So, you know, slight culture shock, you know, I'm 12 years old, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And we're setting up chairs in this YMCA and tearing it all down and we're disinfecting workout rooms so that babies can be in there, you know? And, and my dad, he preached in front of this giant mural of a gymnast, like in an awkward position. And, and I just remember it so clearly that it was in those years of being a teenager in Vegas, being a part of that church plant, is where I came to understand that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is for alcoholics and exotic dancers and for high rollers and for the guy digging through his car cushions for another quarter. I saw the good news come alive to wine goddesses at Caesar's Palace and runaways camping in cheap motels and dealers and bangers and addicts. When I was 17, I went on a journey of my own of running away from God and his pursuit of me coming back to him. And I discovered that this gospel, this good news is for the people pleasing, the conning, the cheat, the impure materialistic rebel. When I was 19, I had the opportunity to live in Haiti for a year, a year that changed my life. And I discovered that this good news of Jesus Christ is for the poor for the forgotten, for the illiterate, for the uneducated, for the oppressed, for the enslaved, for witch doctors, for people dying. I saw the good news bring people clapping outside of mud huts. I learned that it was for children and orphans and people who were starving, literally, and starving for hope. In our 20s, my husband and I had the privilege of working at some amazing churches, um, both in Illinois and in Kentucky. Those are states like that way, um, in case you don't know. But what I learned there was that the gospel was for frat boys and girls gone wild and for the kid that's grown up and knows in Sunday school since the day he was born. That it was for firemen and farmers and truck drivers and stockbrokers and stay-at-home moms and rednecks and seminary graduates, for people with secret lives and stagnant faith, for politicians and factory workers and self-righteous church leaders, for families pretending to have it all together and for those falling apart. So when we planted Mission 11 years ago, I naively thought I'd seen it all. And I'm praying, do it again, God. But do it here, and little did I know that God would break through every box I'd put his gospel in. Not here, but here. And now I have stood speechless watching people surrender their lives to Jesus, going forward in, in baptism, friends that had no hope, find that the heart of God is for them and find real hope for their lives. I think of my friend Deanna, 
former stripper turned prostitute turned porn star who God has so radically transformed, she is unrecognizable. This courageous woman has her master's degree now in spiritual formation, and she is happily married with two beautiful daughters. She has more joy than anyone I know. She, she phrases it like this. She wants her life to be a big thank you to God. And when I'm around her, I'm reminded, oh, Jesus doesn't just make us better. He makes us new. I think about a friend right now that's leading a small group for the first time at church with a group of friends that used to do lines of cocaine together, and now they're doing lines of scripture. I think about a friend who called me one night to check her into a mental facility because she wanted to end her life after being caught in her adultery. And it was in that intake room that I watched this woman shed secrets like 50-pound barbells hitting the floor. And I got to be there when she accepted Jesus into her life and watch her marriage get restored and see forgiveness up close. I've watched homeless friends come up out of that water, terminally ill, victims of sex trafficking, hell's angel bikers, porn producers, people counting days clean. And over and over again, it's like God is saying, you think you've seen it all? We're just getting started. Because my heart, the heart of God is for everyone. The good news is for everyone. This is our story, right? That we would even be in this room. That the grace of God would reach even us. This is our history. This is why when you look back at church history and the centuries that followed the early church, there's nothing that has spread like this good news. Because the good news wasn't just that someone could be saved and redeemed and forgiven through Jesus Christ. The good news was anybody could anyone could, that we all get in. Think about how revolutionary this was at a time when there's a clear class system and who gets in and who gets out. And then you have these followers of Jesus showing up and writing and proclaiming and teaching and living out an anyone kind of hope, saying things like, so in Christ you are now all children of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Or in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. Christ is all that matters. Because this is Jesus. This is who he is. This is how he lived. This is how he turned the world upside down. This is how he showed us the heart of God is for everyone. Jesus brought dignity to those who had none. He embraced little kids. He valued women. He crossed racial divides. He looked at fishermen and saw world changers. And he was constantly criticized by who he let in. And I am so grateful. I mean, you just look at the life of Jesus, and it's right there. Jesus, he met people like me. Took notice of a blind man and made him see. Saw a locked up kid and set him free. Told little Zacchaeus to get out of the tree. He felt it when a desperate woman touched his cloak. Kneeled beside a dead girl and up she woke. He hung out with the down and out and broke. Offered hope to the forgotten with just the words he spoke. He touched a man with leprosy that others would mock. Touched the mouths of the mute and at once they could talk. Forgave a woman at a well who was the laughing stock. Came to be a shepherd to a wandering flock in the company of sinners. That's where he would eat. Defended an adulterer, made her accusers retreat, made followers out of men who were crooked cheats. Let the tears of a prostitute anoint his feet. We've got the same Jesus. And we've got the same good news. And it's not just for us. It's for everyone. Listen, people, people you know need real hope. People desperately need good news. People need fresh starts. People need reconciliation. People need an unfailing love. People need lasting freedom. This is why we dream big. This is why we vision cast. This is why we pray like we've never prayed before. This is why we quit jobs and fundraise. This is why we give sacrificially. This is why we push through fear and step across the line because there is a world of people who are hurting, searching, starving, addicted, confused, and alone. There is a world of hate and anger and racism and poverty and injustice and violence. There is a world of families broken, torn apart, abuse has come, abandonment, bitterness, resentment, and we have a living hope? We know the Savior of the world? Like, like Peter said in Acts chapter 4, salvation's found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It's only ever been Jesus, it will only ever be Jesus that can rescue and save. Are we all on the same page here tonight? This, 
is why I think tonight, since it's only ever been Jesus, this prayer, God, give me your heart for people. I can't think of a better person than Jesus to turn to to see God's heart for people. And so tonight, I want to look at probably the most famous parables that Jesus ever told, maybe very, very familiar to many of you. But I'm praying that these words of Jesus that really do show us what God's heart is like for people will fall on us in like a fresh way as we pray not to have a heart for people, but to have his heart for people. These three parables, these three stories are found in Luke chapter 15, and they show us how God feels about people who are lost. Jesus told them this parable, starting in verse 3, suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home, and then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or he goes on to say, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and, and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then Jesus gets to the last story, the most famous one, right? It's often titled the story of the prodigal son. Maybe you've heard that term prodigal. The literal definition is reckless and, and wastefully extravagant. The broader definition encompasses being lost, foolish, and rebellious. So how does God I know we always put ourselves in this story, but let's just think. How does God feel about people who have walked away? How does God feel about people who have wrecked their lives with their own choices? How does he feel about people who have rebelled? How does he feel about people who are hiding, using, numbing, lying, cheating? How does he feel about anyone who is lost? He tells a story about a father who had two sons. And the younger son goes to the father and he says, like, give me your, my share of the inheritance. Basically, like, I wish you were dead. Show me the money. Like, that's what this was. And everyone listening would have known these implications were huge. Tells us in the story that the father does it. He gives the younger son his share of, of the inheritance. And the son leaves. This would have meant, like, the son is dead to him disowned by the family, actually cut off and ostracized from the entire Jewish community. And so the son takes off. He doesn't care. He goes to a distant land. He like, gets as far away from home as he can. And you know what he does? He blows it all. He blows it all on wild living and parties and nights with friends and girls. And he just blows it all. Nobody's checking in on him. He does anything he wants to fulfill his own pleasure. And then a famine hits. And you know what he finds out? Everything he thought he wanted didn't help when he found himself in need. And the friends were gone, and the parties were gone, and the highs were gone. And he was hungry, and so he went, and he got hired by a man to feed some pigs in a field. That's how Jesus tells the story. Jesus is a brilliant storyteller because the audience would have gasped. This, this guy's going to go work with pigs. Pigs were considered unclean. And then Jesus goes even further to say he was not only working out in the fields with the pigs, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating. I mean, this was repulsive. This was low. Like the only thing I can think of getting close to this low is like my girls that I have raised, you know, properly to be Kentucky basketball fans, if they became Duke fans. Like, okay, it's, it's low. It's real, real low. But what Jesus is really, seriously, what he's illustrating is that this kid, this guy, this son had hit rock bottom. He couldn't get any lower. He smells like pigs. He wants to eat with pigs. He's starving. He's lost everything. And it tells us in verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I love those first six words. When he came to his senses. Isn't that where it's at? Isn't that what we pray for? Those moments where, where people will look around and go, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? What am I doing with these lies? What am I doing in this relationship? What am I doing in this pigsty of a life? But you know, the son knew he couldn't just go home. 
And so he comes up with a speech and he says, I will set out and go back to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father because he knows, man, he's cut off. He's dead to his family. He's ostracized from the community. He's blown it. He's not asking for like, you know, family dinners. He's not asking to be at Christmas. He's not asking for love or acceptance. He's just asking, could I be a servant here? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, you bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Don't you love that picture? You see the son coming home and the father is running down the road, running down the driveway like he's been waiting for this moment. I just imagined it in my mind like it's like the ugly dad run, you know, and he's got to hike up his thing and, and he's, got, he's ugly crying and there's snot in the beard and like the whole thing. And he's just like embracing him, right? And then the son tries to get his speech out and the father interrupts him and says, no, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals, which was symbolic for you're my son again. You're not coming back here as a servant. You're part of this family. No matter what you've done or where you've been, you're my son and you're home. And so we're going to celebrate. And Jesus is saying, this is what God is like. This is what the heart of God is like for people. This is why I welcome sinners and eat with them. This is the heart of the gospel. This is why it's called good news. And I really believe if we allow these three familiar stories, these words of Jesus to reach through 2,000 years of history tonight into our own hearts, it could change the way we think about God. It could reshape the way we see our personal calling. It could shift our prayers. It could transform the way that we view and treat others. It could shape our hearts into having a heart like his for people. So we're going to walk back through. In that first story, Jesus talked about a shepherd who, lost, who had 100 sheep and he lost one, right? And he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. So he's not cool. He's not like, okay, cool, I still got 99. He's going after the one because the one is lost. The one's in trouble. The one's in danger. The one is vulnerable. We see his heart pursuing the one. Do we? Do we have a one or some someones? in our lives that we are intentionally praying for, looking for, loving, pursuing, because it's real easy to get comfortable in our holy huddles and forget that the heart of the Father is out there looking for the one that's not here yet. And then this beautiful imagery of sheep and shepherd that we see all throughout Scripture, we see here that this is a heart that God has for people that is gentle and humble because that's what a shepherd is like. Isaiah 40 says he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. This is like a shepherd. Jesus put it this way in his invitation for people to come to him. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice Jesus doesn't say, come to me all who are winning and thriving. Come to me all who are living their best life now. Come to me all who are perfect and polished. Come to me all who have gotten their lives cleaned up first. No, he says, come to me if you are weary. If you are burdened, you got a heavy burden, come to me. For I am gentle and I am humble in heart like a shepherd. You know, this yoke talk that Jesus was referring to is, is talking about a yoke that's placed over oxen, like to get them to plow. It's like this heavy thing that wraps around their necks and weighs on their shoulders. And there's usually somebody running the plow, like with a whip. And Jesus says, I am nothing like that. And God is nothing like that. God is not about putting a heavy weight on people's shoulders and whipping them into shape, saying, keep striving. Keep going, keep plowing, even though you're barely making it. No, he says, come to me, come to me. I'm nothing like that. 
You can find a different way here. You can find grace here. You can find comfort here. You can find rest for your soul here. Jesus, he, he paints such a different picture of himself than someone, you know, whipping the oxen. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That's who he is. And, you know, although it's, you know, real good for us and people not to be oxen in this metaphor, you know, where we're putting a heavy yoke on us and God's just whipping us into shape, it's also not great being compared to sheep um, because sheep are just dumb, you know? Sheep aren't all that smart. Sheep get themselves into trouble all the time. Sheep are super vulnerable. I know you've probably seen this video. It's circulated for, you know, like a year now. Um, but it's this young boy rescuing the sheep. Uh, check this out. Let's watch this again. Oh, I oh, oh, no. What, what is, is that? Oh, oh, come on. Oh, 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 he's showing. What is going on? Oh, it's a good news story. It gets better. Yeah. It was a good news story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, isn't that how it is sometimes? God pulls us out of the ditch, and we run and jump right back in. And listen, of course, God doesn't want that for us. He wants to lead us. He wants to live with him in a new way. But also, let me say this, God does not approach us like stupid sheep. Can't believe you did that again. Can't believe you fell for that again. Same ditch, dummy, you know. This is, good luck, you know, because I'm done. No, we have a God, a good shepherd that laid down his life to get us out again and again. He says, I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lay down in peace, says the sovereign Lord. I will search for my lost ones who have strayed away and I will bring them safely home again. I will bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. This is the heart of God for all who have strayed and wandered and lost their way and are injured and hurting and in danger and in trouble. And listen, while this is good news for us personally, like, we love this. If we want to have a heart like God for people, this is what it looks like. It looks like care. It looks like bandaging. It looks like attention. And I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last five years, gentle and humble aren't the first words that come to people's mind to describe Christians. Arrogant and harsh, judgmental and divisive, Shaming and condemning, canceling and correcting. And the picture people get then of God is heavy and strict and full of striving and punishment. And it's so far from the heart of God. And there are so many people who are weary and burdened that need to hear the real invitation of Jesus. The real invitation of Jesus and, and really need to know how God feels about them and will bring them back in. And guess what? We are Christ ambassadors, and he is making his appeal through us, so we have got to cultivate a heart like his that is gentle and humble with people, a heart that represents the heart of our Father. This means we got to listen with empathy. we got to walk with people through the ditch. We're going to have to carry some burdens. We're going to have to help the hurting. We're going to have to have a lot of patience to care, to love, to show up again and again with compassion. Something that I've learned as in my own life, but also in walking with others, is that transformation in someone's life looks a lot like grace plus truth plus time. And we tend to just love the grace and truth part, right? But we forget that sometimes this takes time. And people relapse. And they change their number on you. And they ghost you and they go back to the same ditch and the path is not always up and to the right. But if we are gonna have a heart like his for people, we humbly and gently restore and walk beside and keep giving grace and keep giving truth and over time they might just get God's heart for them and accept the invitation of Jesus Christ. Then we see this illustration of a woman who had 10 silver coins and she lost one. Now in this day, Women usually receive 10 coins as a wedding gift. So this was not just, you know, a monetary thing. This was personal. This was sentimental. This was valuable. I remember this happening, um, something similar when I was a kid. My mom had been in like one of those deep clean days, you know. Usually that happens when she's mad at my dad. She's like cleaning everything, right. She's like mowing the yard, cleaning out the car. She cleaned everything that day. And at the end of the day, she realized that the diamond from her engagement ring had come out. And like... Like, it was gone. Like, it, could, it wasn't a big rock. It was like what my dad could afford when he was 20. So, like, it was a tiny, and it could have been anywhere. 
But we still turned that house upside down. Everything she has straightened, we unstraightened. We were looking everywhere all night long. And do you know that my little brother, who was eight years old at the time, found that diamond in a window seal? I mean, he is still their favorite child, you know? He, he is. It's true. He is. Um, but this is the level for the woman in our story. This would have been a deep loss. This is why she lights every lamp and she turns over the couch cushions and she gets out the Swiffer and she's going under the bed and she looks in every nook and cranny until she finds it. And I love how this shows us the heart of God that he sees people as so valuable. There's no shadow he won't light up, no mountain he won't climb up, no wall he won't tear down, no, no lie he won't kick down coming after his own. Every person is valuable to God. Every person created in his image for his glory. Jesus showed us this when he walked the planet because no one had ever seen like Jesus. Jesus noticed that tax collector up in the tree. He noticed the woman who touched his garment, even though he's jostled by the crowd. He, he saw a widow. No one else would have given a second glance. He gave recognition to little children the crowd was trying to make disappear. His life shows us God pays close attention to us because we're valuable. He has numbered every hair. If one falls out, he notices. I mean, I'm sorry for some of you dudes. He does not replace them. But, you know, he, he notices. He notices. And when we start to get a heart like his for people, we begin to see people differently. We begin to pay attention to people the way that we know God pays attention to us and the way that God pays attention to people and we see people through a different lens. We start to realize, whoa, I will not lock, lock eyes with anyone today that doesn't deeply matter to God. And they deserve to be seen. And they deserve to be seen as valuable. And do you know how many people, how many people in our lives, in our classrooms, on our teams, at our workplaces, on the soccer sidelines, just don't know how valuable they are to God? So many people that feel worthless because of the bullying, because of their grades, because of the rejection, because of the failed marriage, because of the DUI, because of the financial situation, because of their past, they don't feel valuable at all. And we get to be people who see beyond all of that and see the intrinsic worth of everyone. And we get to see people and treat people and love people and show up for people and encourage people and invest in people in a way that shows them, you know what I know? God paid a high price for you that every person we meet is worth Jesus to God. And you know what, we, we don't just see that neighbor anymore or that friend or that classmate, or we don't just see that person anymore as broken, as homeless, as an addict. We start to see worthy, accepted, priceless, loved. We begin to see what God sees if he were looking through our eyes. And our heart begins to break for what breaks the heart of God. And we begin to pay attention to what God cares about most. And that is people. They're so valuable. we got to have a heart that sees them. And then, of course, we get to the picture of the father man running down the driveway to embrace that kid. After he just blew it. And we see the heart of God that he meets people where they are. This kid showed up busted, humiliated, broke, starving, covered in pig slop. I mean, when I pictured this story, Jesus doesn't say, so he, you know, went to a hotel and he got cleaned up and he changed his clothes. No, none of that. Like, he's coming down the driveway a mess. I imagine the father wrapping his arms around him and he's dirty and he's smelly and he's just a shell of the son that he once knew. And isn't this such a beautiful picture of how Jesus shows up in the middle of our mess too? Because that's who he is. And I, I am so grateful for that. I mean, we see it all throughout the life of Jesus. He shows up right in the middle of the mess. And he's shown up right in the middle of my mess like so many times I can't even count. And it's so comforting for me to know that I don't have to get things figured out first. And I don't have to become a better version of myself first before God will meet with me. No, the opposite is true. The place he most desires to meet with us is in our brokenness. He came for it. He lives for it. He died for it. To meet us in those messy places, those hurt places, those overwhelmed places, those shameful places, because he's a God that longs to be with us right where we are. 
and not leave us there. Some of my favorite words in the New Testament of the Bible are in John chapter 8. This woman, man, she's caught in the act of adultery, and the religious leaders drag her out and throw her in, in front of a big crowd, in front of a bunch of religious people, in front of Jesus, down in the dirt. I mean, you ever been caught in the act of something and everybody wants to stone her? Can you imagine how she was feeling? So embarrassed, so trapped, so guilty, so ashamed. And they asked Jesus what to do with her. And they all got rocks in their hand, just ready to judge her. And it tells us in John chapter 8, verse 6, but Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. And a lot of people have tried to speculate on what did Jesus write in the dust with his finger? Like, what was he writing? I don't have a clue what he was writing because the words that have changed my life are simply that Jesus stooped down because that's where she was. He got in the mess with her, in the dirt with her. He met her right where she was, and that's what Jesus has done for me. I don't know about you, but Jesus got right in the middle of my mess, and he lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire, and he placed my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He meets me where I am, not where I pretend to be, and it can be messy. And I'm so grateful for a God who, who meets us in the middle of our mess. And listen, church. If we desire to be more like him, if we want to have a heart like his, if we want our communities and our churches and our small groups and our families to reflect who he is, then I believe he is calling us to meet people right where they are, right in the mess of it, embarrassed, trapped, afraid, used, dirty, exposed, hopeless. That's where we meet people. And listen, we are only able to do this when we live in the awareness that he had to get down in the dirt for every single one of us too. It's it's knowing our own desperate need for the grace of God that enables us to meet, to go out, to leave this room and meet other people where they are. We can't lose sight of the amazing grace on our lives. We can't lose sight of the cross before us because it is Christ's love that compels us. We'd be crazy if we didn't have Christ's love compelling us. It's the love that we've experienced, the rescue that we've lived through, the grace that we've been shown that leads us to be a part of creating spaces and leading our families and planting churches where we don't get to say, oh, oh, not you. No, not with that issue. Ooh, not with that criminal record. Not with that reputation. No, we say welcome. We believe there is hope for you through Jesus Christ. Because who is the good news for It is for everyone. And man, I'm just praying that we would grasp to have a heart like God's for people, a heart that is searching for the lost, a heart that is gentle and humble, a heart that sees people for how valuable they are, and a heart that is willing to meet people where they are, and lastly, a heart that rejoices because he rejoices. You know the heart of God rejoices. Every one of these stories, there's a party, right? The shepherd, the woman, they call everybody. They're like, I found my sheep, I found my coin, you know. They call all their friends and neighbors, and they throw a party. They say, rejoice with me. And the father, man, he's taking out robes, and he's killing calves, and he's got rings, and he's got a DJ. And Jesus says, like, this is what heaven is like. No, he actually says, there's more rejoicing in heaven. Like, can you imagine a heaven party? Can you imagine how much rejoicing is going on? Jesus says, it is crazy what happens when one person who is lost gets found. Heaven goes crazy. And may we never grow cold to that. And and may it never grow old to us when one person who is lost runs home to their father. If we want a heart for God, we got to party better. Like, no golf claps during baptism anymore, okay? Like, we, we got we to gotta party more because these are souls coming home. These are addictions being broken. This is hope getting found. These are new creations. These are family lines changing. This is freedom. This is hope. And this is worth celebrating. This is the heart of the Father for people. And I know I've already rhymed one time in this message, um, and I usually have like a one rhyme rule. Like, I mean, you know, it's a little much. But hey, this is revival. Um, So uh, I just got thinking. I started thinking, because this is personal, right? This This is our state. This is our family. This is the vision of God for the people we know and love. 
And I kept wondering, like, what if? What if we did actually pray for a heart like his for people? What if we prayed for our one? What if we walked with people gently and humbly? What if we changed the way that we saw our neighbors and our friends? What if we met people where they're at? What if? What if we, the church, all of us, began to live a little dangerous, came out from hiding behind the brush and allowed God to light a flame in us? What if? What if we began a revolution, became a part of the solution, got in the business of the distribution of love, grace, mercy, that our grips would loosen? What if? What if we knew what God said? Let his word wrap around our hearts and our head more than words on a page collecting dust unread. Instead, we live like this book is alive and not dead. What if? What if our churches were thriving? People finding hope, no depriving, no striving, more than just surviving, but rising up to give, serve, invest, care, guide, to set aside our pride, to decide to abide, to walk beside a place where people can find and where love is supplied and where grace will preside. What if? What if you're 12, 14, 16, 20, but live with a courage unlike many? Possess valor, boldness, and faith plenty. Let God write your story from the beginning. Hand him the pen and let him start pinning that all the someday's I'll be. They're phony, they're fleeting. You are worthy now and your life has meaning. What if, what if we unleashed compassion, flung our faith into action? and opened our hands, our homes, our wallets, our doors to the lonely, the outcast, the hurting, the poor. We gave to each other and didn't keep score, humbled ourselves so that someone could soar, proclaim the goodness of God like never before. What if? What if our what ifs are more than just words that we say? More than just a game we play? What if we didn't stray or sway or live our lives trying to stay safe? What if instead tonight we pray, God, give us your heart and have your heart way. I think God would do more in this community, in this valley, across the valley, on the coast, in Ventura, in Santa Barbara, in St. Louis Obispo, in the Ojai Valley, across this nation, and across the globe than we could ask, dream, or imagine. What if? God, I thank you tonight. First, Jesus, let me just say thank you for showing us your heart for us. Thank you for coming for us. Thank you, God, for loving us, pursuing us, coming after us. It is not lost on us. And God, tonight, we humbly, humbly and boldly and courageously ask you for this. Give us your heart for people. In Jesus' name, amen.